But guess what? 19 year olds and 18 year olds in college, because that's how old I was when I worked there, like 18 to 20 years old, they're not gonna have that experience anymore if, if you work at a fast food restaurant in California, yeah. because why would they hire you? Why would they hire me? Because I had like, I had schedule constraints because I was on the wrestling team. So I'm like, okay, I can only work these days from these hours. I can only do this, that, and that. And they worked around it because guess what? I was, they were only paying me $2.83 an hour. The rest of the money I made was yes. from collecting tips, but at these fast yes, casual they didn't restaurants. they a huge cut hiring that, you. That, yeah. yeah, it was nothing to them. But at these uh, fast casual and fast food restaurants in California where they're not tipped workers, they're making exorbitant amounts now, $20 an hour. Sorry, you're gonna get one hour a week, your coworker's gonna be a robot, and then you're gonna get fired next month. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Undoctrination. My name is Maggie. And I'm Olivia. And as you can see, we have Olivia in studio today. Yay. I'm so excited. Me too, finally I'm back. Yes, finally. So Olivia is gonna be in, in Atlanta all week long. We're filming a bunch of great podcasts for the month of October. Maybe we'll get into some spooky stuff, who knows. Um, it is my absolute favorite month of the year. I love the fall. Um, and today, I wanted to talk to you guys about the minimum wage. Olivia brought it to my attention <sighs> that California is yet again doing some crazy stuff. Sorry. So we love Gavin Newsom, don't we, folks? We do love Woo! Gavin Newsom. We love, we love him. He looks like Patrick Bateman, and he does even more psycho <laughs> things than Patrick Bateman did mm -hmm. in American Psychos. So California, since 2017, they were put on basically a five-year wage increase plan to $15. So they basically increased like $5.50 in five years, which is already insane. So now for fast food workers, the uh, minimum wage has increased again, another whopping $5 to $20 minimum wage. So uh, flipping burgers at McDonald's, um, making waffles at Waffle, actually California does have Waffle Houses, fun fact, but anything like that, it's $20. Even if you don't produce $20 an hour Do you for the company. something company. crazy? What? So you said five dollars in how many years? Five. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but the first min federal minimum wage in 1979 was two dollars and seventy nine cents, and now it's seven dollars and twenty five cents. So the federal minimum wage hasn't even increased that much in what, like, forty years? Yeah. California is so, just, just worlds above in yeah. stupidity because there shouldn't be a minimum wage at all. But we'll get into why that is, but... Yeah, California obviously is one of the worst states economically to live in if you are not making $5 trillion a year. Um, my dad actually just moved to California and it's very expensive out there. Like, I've, I've definitely considered moving out there eventually because it's just so beautiful. It is. But it is very expensive. And I think that's probably what's behind this minimum wage increase is that it's just really, really difficult to afford to live but in California. But you know California. what's behind that? The minimum wage it's, increase, It's dog. like the snake <laughs> eating its tail. You know, it's the, the cycle that keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And there are a lot of reasons for this. But I just, I, to get back to the point, like 15, the fight for 15 was a huge deal in what? The, the past The past five 10 years, years five yeah. years. In 2017, they're like, okay, we're, we finally are getting 15. So they made this whole plan, this whole deal that actually ended up to be pretty unfair to small business owners. So in January of 2017, the minimum wage for employers with 25 employees or less, they increased it to $10. For larger corporations, you know, 26 or more, it was 1050. That's a small difference, but they still gave some small business owners some leeway. Over time, um, it went to 10.50 for small business in 2018, then 11, then 20. In 2020, it was 12, then 13. But by 2023, both small businesses with under 25 employees. So this includes people who are just self-employed. They might have one or two assistants. All the way to big corporations like McDonald's, they're they were both paying 15.50. So. I mean, it just, it, only big box corporations and huge franchises mm -hmm. can survive this. The mom yes. and pop shop cannot afford to pay the same as Walmart. And now it's gonna be even worse because 
California has now designated these these fast food restaurants. They're calling them something else now. They're calling them, what are they calling them? Quick serve restaurants. So this isn't just McDonald's. This isn't just Burger King. It's any quick serve restaurant like now Chipotle has to pay. Yeah, this too? includes okay. this includes the, these like fast casual quick serve. You know, anything with a drive through, anything that's fast casual, where you order at the counter, you take your food mm-hmm. and you go. Um, Twenty dollars an hour. Twenty dollars an that's hour. That's crazy. And people are, use this emotional argument. Like, what am I supposed to do? Just starve? I can't raise a family off of $15 an hour in California. What if I need to work, work to raise my kids and work at McDonald's? Okay, so we will never see, in California, you'll never see a high schooler or young adult, a teenager, a student working at McDonald's ever again. It's going to be people literally raising their families off of McDonald's, Mm -hmm. and where do young adults work? Where do young adults work? Because a 16-year-old with no GED can work at McDonald's, but they will never hire one for $20 an hour if they can get a college graduate who's paying off their student loans, a single mother who's supporting Mm -hmm. their family. So you leave an entire unemployable chunk of kids who need that experience to go on. Yeah, I mean, that brings up a great first point. I think one of the strongest arguments against minimum wage, period, let alone these drastic minimum wage hikes, is that it affects workers disproportionately. Like, there are some workers who will benefit, and those are going to be your highest skilled workers. So the people who do have a college degree or do have a high school diploma and all of these years of work experience. But if you have all of these things, you're not gonna wanna work at McDonald's. You're not gonna wanna work at a fast casual restaurant. You're gonna wanna go and work in your field in an actually skilled job, right? But these other people who don't have education, don't have service experience, don't have all of these skills, where do they go? They don't get jobs, that's for sure. Like it's going to become a lot harder for your average teenager to get a job, but also their hours are gonna be cut at the jobs that they currently have. So it does disproportionately affect people that aren't you know, as skilled. Um, and there is some data to back this up. Um, that like even with like small increases in minimum wage, which maybe California would argue that like a $1 increase is a small increase, although they were doing it every single year. Um, With those small increases, yes, it's true. Those marginalized workers that have very little education, no high school diploma, no college degree, they're going to get affected first and not be able to feed their families, but with these large increases, like a jump from $15 to $20, it affects everyone. You see unemployment start to happen across the board. So this isn't actually a good thing for workers, and there's a lot of politics happening behind the scenes. Um, Typically, politicians are a little weary of raising the minimum wage this high, this drastically, because it does leave this whole class of people who suddenly become unemployed, and therefore that's going to hurt their reelection chances. I have no idea what Gavin Newsom is thinking. Um, Have you seen these interviews with him recently? He (laughs) seems like he's... Like like a super villain he's who's going to be running for president. He's on American Psycho stuff. I'm not even saying that just because he <laughs> greases his hair back like him, but he literally is just, I mean, I don't know if he's an evil mastermind or if he's just like a useful puppet for somebody else mm-hmm. who is the evil mastermind, but either way, the end result is the same. And even before Gavin Newsom in California was on this stuff, but he's just made it worse. Yeah. I was looking into some older studies to see the effects of minimum wage increases in California over time, and there was this 2000 study from the Public Policy Institute of California that found that raising the minimum minimum wage would, quote, cause poor Californians to pay proportionately more for basic services Mm -hmm. such as groceries because of the minimum wage increases, so do labor costs. So employers respond to increasing wages in one of three ways. One, they increase prices, Mm -hmm. reduce employment, or reduce profits. And corporations, companies, they're not going to reduce their profits. They're not going to reduce their profits. So you're getting your hours cut, Mm -hmm. you're just getting fired, 
and the Big Mac meal is now $30. Yeah. So, Usually they're going to do a little bit of all three, over, right? Yeah. Over, over two decades later, we mm -hmm. have found this to be true. If you look at the Consumer Price Index report from the California Department of Finance, the CPI jumped from 60 points from the 30 years from 1950 to 1980. That's pretty normal growth. There's a lot of factors that go into inflation and cost of living increases. But after years of wage increases and inflation from federal and state policies from just 2000 to 2022, so 22 years compared compared to 30 years, it dropped 174 points. This directly correlates to, uh, you know, cost of living increases directly correlate to artificially inflating the value of labor because that's what it is. And mm -hmm. people get so pissed off and so emotional when I say this, but unskilled labor is a real thing. There's no shame in it. I worked in the restaurant industry. Almost I everybody has worked in restaurant, yeah. retail, and I think that everybody should at least work one of those jobs mm -hmm. because you kind of know what it's like and you get people's skills, communication skills, mm -hmm. and uh, work ethic for later in life. However, if your job could be taught to a 16-year-old in a week or a month or however long it takes for somebody to get trained at McDonald's a week or two, it's unskilled labor. And yeah. there's literally nothing wrong with that. But yes. it was never designed for you to raise a family off of. It was never designed to be a lifelong career if you're not moving up in the ranks because there was this whole debate about Waffle House. Oh, if what if I wanted to make my career a Waffle House? Mm -hmm. I should deserve to earn a living wage. Yeah, if you work up and become the general manager or a yeah. franchise owner of a Waffle House, more power to you. Hey, Waffle House has different levels of I grill love master. <laughs> I don't know okay. if you've been to a, a Waffle House recently, <laughs> but they post it. There's different levels of like the grill master with different wages that you're getting paid. They're not being paid poorly, and I'll tell you this, in Georgia, we don't have a $15 minimum wage, and they're making close to that. So, you know, also, when it, when it comes to the discussions of minimum wage, that's talking about the lowest amount that a business is legally allowed to pay you on an hourly basis. That is not covering what most people make. In fact, in fact, only 1.4% of all hourly paid workers actually make minimum wage or below. 1.4% of hourly paid workers. Let's see how much that increases to when they increase the fast food uh, yeah, wage exactly. to $20. It's exactly. totally going to price out an entire group of workers. Mm -hmm. It's going to be students, young people, teenagers, uh, really anyone who's looking for their first job. Because yeah. who's going to hire Immigrants? somebody for $20 an hour? I'm sorry. Yeah. This is this is like a, a really big deal for people who are coming to this country and trying to get their start here. You know, they don't have, if they don't have any work experience, like, and, and you the, would not be a smart business owner if you yeah. hired somebody for their first job, especially their first job in this country for $20 an hour. You'd no. be an idiot to hire that person. I did not deserve to make $20 an hour when I was first starting out, okay? I was learning how to be a good worker and like how to communicate with customers. I think I made probably seven fifty dollars an hour when I first started off and the federal minimum wage, which is what it is in Louisiana, is $7.25. So even my first job, I was hired maybe, it was only a quarter, <laughs> like 25 cents above minimum wage. But even there, it wasn't minimum wage, right? And mm -hmm. that's because businesses want to be able to attract um, more talented labor, even if you are just getting started off, right? So most people are not making what the bottom of the barrel is in terms of wages that you can get. Most people are working a little bit above that, even if it's, it's their first job, even if it's their first job. And one of the big problems with minimum wage, which we've kind of talked about already, is that it does increase the cost of living for everyone. And I know that progressives love to get mad about stuff like sales tax and say that's you know, a regressive tax that's harming poor people um, because it makes the products that we consume more expensive and it's just like, it's, you know, whatever. It's like pennies to rich people. It's the same thing with cost mm -hmm. of living. You know, it maybe it affects rich people a little bit, but when it comes to your average person who's like struggling to pay for groceries, struggling to pay for gas, struggling to pay for food, struggling to find affordable housing, which does not exist in California, it just makes all of these problems worse. Because like Olivia said, if the cost of labor is rising, businesses either have to purchase less of that thing or 
they have to bring in more money. And usually they're going to do both. Yeah, and then with this bill, so uh, Newsom, it was last week on September 28th, he signed California Assembly Bill 1228, and not only did this increase the minimum wage for quick-serve restaurant workers to $20, but it also created this thing. It established a fast food council with limited authority to adjust wages annually. So who's to say that this council that Newsom put together can't say, well, we want $30? This does feel like the meme. Yeah, because it's it's completely arbitrary. This number... $15, $15, it was $15 for so long that now people like Nina Turner from Ohio are arguing for $30. I mean, it, yeah. it's going to be $40, it's going to be $50. It was 15 because it was catchy. Fight for 15 Yeah. Like, genuinely, it was a political slogan. Yeah. And that's all this is. It's marketing. Like, I, I was talking about this the other day. Populism, that's what this is. It's like advocating for the working class interests, right? Um, a lot of it is based on like manipulating people who do not make a lot of money and don't understand what's happening and promising them something that sounds really good, but really it ends up harming them in the end. And it allows politicians to like siphon things off the top. But that's, that's really what minimum wage is for me. Like I, it, it isn't going to help people the way they think it is. It's not going to help know? them at all. I mean, these people think they're on the side of the working class. They want to hand everybody $20 an hour. I think that a lot of these people, especially the people who are like protesting for this and advocating yeah. for this, a lot of people in working class and fast food jobs themselves, they don't know what they're doing wrong. They think they're on the good side. And I empathize a lot. But these... These politicians aren't stupid. I mean, a lot of them are dumb, but they're conniving in a way yeah. that a lot of people just don't really comprehend because mm-hmm. um, there's this really great article on Fee.com talking about the eugenics of minimum wage. And the argument is essentially, and it kind of goes into what we were talking about, how all this this new class of people, um, people who are getting their first job, people who may not be a college or high school graduate, young people, immigrants, they're going to be, become undesirable mm-hmm. to employers. And that's literally going to make them either not be able to support their families or they're just not going to have them because they can't afford them. They can't afford to have kids. They won't be able to afford to buy a home, save for retirement. This underclass of people is, I mean, we already know that the middle class is shrinking. So this is going to take a huge chunk of people from the middle class or who would be middle class. Maybe they come from a middle class family, but they still need their first job. They still need to graduate, whatever, whatever. It's taking this chunk of people and just like throwing them out of mm-hmm. the the workforce. Um, and so that can directly translate to eugenics, whether by way of they're literally too poor to afford to improve their life in any way and they just mm-hmm. literally could die off because we all know that big pharma in this country has made affording medicine and medical care almost impossible, but also by way of just not having kids, not having a family, not reproducing for the future. And we all know that a big chunk of this, this uh, a big, a large proportion of these people is going to be minorities in the working class, yeah. immigrants, black people, Latinos. It's going to be It also it's leaves be bad. people more reliant on the state Yeah, for handouts, you know? Um, and I don't say handouts is like, oh, it's bad if you take these. They're there. We pay you for know? them. We um, pay for them. We, they as are as there. We pay like, you know, fair enough, but um, it does make you more reliant on the state if you are unable to find work. And, like, I think the qualifications to receive unemployment are that you're actively searching but can't get a job, right? That's what they say. It's pretty easy to get around it, but that's what they say. But that's that's essentially what this does. I really, I would love to spend an hour with Gavin Newsom just Asking why, like really I would like him to take a basic it. macroeconomics class. Just what's behind it? Because taking it macroecon, seem, yeah, yeah, taking macroecon in college. I mean, I was already a capitalist before that, but even at my liberal progressive school, yeah. they really couldn't skirt around the fact that these artificially inflating the uh, the value of labor, artificially mm-hmm. devaluing the value of the dollar. It's just, yeah, I wouldn't want to pick Newsom's brain about this. Just be like, hey, did you um. Did it's you learn an- about this in school at all, sir? <laughs> yeah, it's just an absolute recipe for disaster. And like I said before, California is already in a very rough place. I'm sure you guys have seen these videos of San Francisco and L.A. and just like the insanely big um, homeless populations that are living on the streets. And I do think there is an argument that, you know, to be said that some people come to California because of the good weather and it's like, 
Oh, probably one of the better places to be homeless. But at the same time, it is nearly impossible to afford housing out there. Yeah. Just, And I think that the population on Skid Row will exponentially multiply as we keep artificially raising wages because yeah. it's going to price more people out. And, you know, certain types of people, and this is no knock, but this is just the reality of homelessness, a lot of homeless people, especially the type of people that live on Skid Row, they're not homeless because they're poor. So they're homeless because they have mental health issues, mm -hmm. drug issues, and they've leaned on this crutch, which is Skid Row, and they get free stuff from the government and they get to use drugs. All it takes to break a lot of people is losing is losing your job, getting your hours cut, not being able to pay for things because the, the cost yeah. of living is so high. So it's a combination. Because you could be broke and not end up on Skid Row, but if it's broke and you're in California with a huge, overwhelming welfare state, huge drug problem, the, the, the homeless population, the drug addict population will yeah. multiply. I mean, yeah, like losing one job could in, make you end up on the street. The and this will, this will lead to people losing jobs. Yeah. Like, just logically, logically. Um, let's say, okay, example. I wanted to talk about the pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks. Olivia, how often do you buy a pumpkin spice latte? Maybe once a week. Okay. And it's like $5, $6? I get a venti, so it could be closer to $6, but okay. yeah. <laughs> let's say we doubled that. No. Yes. <laughs> I probably wouldn't buy anymore because sometimes I talked about this last time. I started making it at home because it is yeah. a little bit expensive and inconvenient. But yeah, I just wouldn't buy it anymore. Exactly. Like when things, when the price of things rise, you tend to buy less of that. Thing. It would be an occasional treat. An I'd, occasion get it, exactly. I'd get it like one time. That's in what autumn. Starbucks is for me because yeah. I'm like, I don't know about. Five dollars for a coffee. I have an addiction, guys. I have a problem. It was good. We I, had some. When today. I'm on Skid Row, I'm gonna be like injecting like the pumpkin cold foam into my veins. Not if I'm not if I'm on Skid Row when I am, because I will eventually when, get priced out. Yeah, well, I'll get priced out. <laughs> I mean, didn't uh, didn't California do something with um, with contract work? Oh, yeah, ago? it's like impossible to be a freelancer now. They make it so hard. And because the whole thing was basically a bunch of Uber drivers, I believe, Uber, Lyft drivers, people yeah. who work in those type of contracts. Um, a lot of people were mad. Also, freelance writers were mad because it kind of goes along with like the writer strike. Because yeah. uh, the writer strike was a lot of uh, freelance television writers getting mad because they don't have health care benefits, they don't have a yearly salary. Wah, 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 wah. So now a lot of employers are forced to um, pay these people a lot more, give them all these benefits, and guess what? That cuts a big chunk of people out because there's a lot of people, this is their first writing job. Maybe this is their first time working on TV or for Uber drivers, for example. Maybe they just got a car. Maybe they haven't been driving for too long. They really want to get better at it and work their way up. No, you're not gonna because there's no way that ABC or whatever is gonna pay writers on full-time salary, full-time yeah. benefits to be Learners, not even mediocre, but just learning. No, you mm -hmm. have to be expert level. You have to be in the game. You have to know people. And so this writer strike that just happened, I believe it just ended, I think it's going to be pretty drastic. I think the changes are going to yeah. be disastrous. Um, I think TV is going to get really weird because TV was really weird in the time that there was no writers. I'll give them that. They definitely did impact TV. I noticed it. If you watch late night television, which I rarely do, but I sometimes watch like Bill Maher, you do, you do notice yeah. things. Um, at the BET Awards, there was like no host, so wait, really? <laughs> they just played music. <laughs> so <laughs> there have been things oh like that gosh. because there's no writers. Yeah. But with this happening, there's going to be a lot less writers, and they're going to be super overworked because if they're if you're hiring them for full time benefits, guess what, buddy? You're going to be working 25 yeah. hours a day, and you're not going to have your little assistants because you're, the guy that runs to get you coffee, they're not on full time salary and benefits. I watched the video, I think his name is Adam Carolla, okay. that he put out, and he said that there is a minimum number of workers yeah. you're legally or con contractually yeah. bound to hire. So these shows have to do it. So they're going to have to pay them a certain wage and hire a certain number of them. Best believe. Your average, like, no. just getting started off. They're not hiring 25 writer. Steven Spielbergs, okay? Yeah. They're not hiring whoever who from Vine or whatever this anymore. Is a, this is a, a voluntary contract that they entered into, so I'm intrigued to see how it's going they to play out. They deserve what but, they get. But Sorry. I'm assuming that 
things will not work out as well in the writer's favor as they believe. It won't. And anytime you see a bunch of celebrities being like, we're on strike with you, because you see all these celebrities marching down the picket line. I saw Margot Robbie, thank God for, bar- she waited till that Barbie check cleared for her, to, for her to appear on the picket line. She was like. I think they were exempted from the strike. <laughs> they were like, Barbie's too important right yeah. now. Yeah, so she waited for Barbie check to clear, then she got on the picket line. They don't care. Do you think Margot Robbie's affected by the minimum wage or how many people work no, on the movie? No, she's or right showing for a show? solidarity she's with the other. Solidarity. other I'd, actors. Yeah. Anytime that your argument is against all the rich Hollywood people and the rich Hollywood people are on your side, dude, bye. <laughs> bye. Like you got played. Yeah. Yeah. It's you it's rough yourself. out here. But but thinking about the contract law, I'm, is it still in effect? I gotta do more research on okay. that. Um, I really don't know. I hope not. I hope not. Let me, let me, I let hope me not. find out. Okay. Find out. While she's researching that, imagine you get fired from your job at McDonald's or they cut you back to like 10 hours a week, right? So you're only making $200 a week because they can't afford you to pay you $20 an hour and keep you on for 40 hours a week. So you try to go get your little side job, a side gig with Uber, and they won't hire you because you can't be a contract laborer. I mean, what do you do? Oh yeah, this was this has been in place uh, since 2019. Gavin Newsom signed Assembly Bill Five, and so it just makes it super hard for employers to keep contractors. They, it wants to force people to designate contractors as employees, essentially. So they make them do this whole test: Does the contractor have freedom to do whatever they want? Does the contractor uh, is the contractor under control from the employer? I'm like. I don't know how many jobs I've done where I've had to like my uh, not my employer but my client or my boss calls me and says like, I need to do this. Okay, well I would like to keep my contract that was in my contract yeah. that I agreed to because mm-hmm. um, I don't need big daddy government saying what could be in my contract or what I agreed to or not. And I jump on the call and I do the thing. But in California, it's like no, you're an employee. If you answer to your client or if you answer to your boss that you have a contractual relationship with, sorry, you're an employee. And so people are just hiring a lot less people. I just feel like this is, these are both classic examples of this paternalistic attitude from the government. Like, okay, um, I need to tell businesses what's best for workers. We need to help workers. Um, And it just ends up negatively affecting everybody. I, I don't understand Gavin Newsom and his logic. Well, Honestly. I mean, he, and he might be our president in the future, bro. Dude, it, like 2028. I'm scared. I'm scared. That's when the real the real election is happening. This one's just gonna be like 2020, part two. I mean, Gavin Newsom himself is a big business owner. He owns these wine corporations and stuff throughout oh, California. He yeah, he employs lots and lots and lots of people, and his clients are very, very, very rich people. So it won't matter to him what yeah. the minimum wage is or minimum wage increases, it doesn't matter to him at all. It matters to people who don't work at McDonald's or Del Taco or all the big businesses in California Mm -hmm. because McDonald's could probably afford to pay their people $20 an hour, but the cashier is going to be a robot and you're going to work two hours a week. But these mom mom and pop shops, they will literally just close down. Yeah. Yeah. Or they they just have to, like, keep restricting the amount of labor. Yeah. If you guys have noticed, there's been, like, a worker shortage... And I can't tell, so businesses started voluntarily increasing their wages after COVID because it was the only way to compete in the market for workers Um, because so few people wanted to come back and start working in fast food or the restaurant industry again. So, you know, by the way, again, most people don't work minimum wage jobs. Like mm-hmm. even even McDonald's, I'm sure, is now paying much more than minimum wage. But a lot of these places were having trouble staffing. And it's the effects are felt when they have to cut back on on labor. Like it makes every trip to Cava or wherever a total nightmare yeah. for the customer. But as someone who has worked in those fast casual places before, it makes it a nightmare for the workers. 
I feel bad for them because I'm never yeah. I'm never a Karen. But you see the increase of Karens come Dude. because if you've been to a grocery store with like in the last three years, like ever since COVID, there's like one cashier line open, mm -hmm. and then people are mad. I feel bad for the person who did show up to work, but it yeah. became a very lucrative business to sit your butt at home and collect unemployment because unemployment checks are getting bigger and bigger too. That's the other kind of wage increase that we're seeing. That's that's kind of creating the labor shortage because it's much more fun to sit at home and collect your money because. In a lot of cases, it's more than you would make working minimum wage yeah. for however many hours a week. So um, speaking of that, another effect we've seen of increasing minimum wage law, uh, minimum wage requirements is that people who grow up in those areas tend to make less in their later 20s because they don't pursue higher education and skills training. So it... Like, all of these things handicap people from pushing further and trying to increase their skills and get better jobs. And that's very sad. Like, we've seen that, we've seen that with welfare programs that people, like, feel comfortable in this particular situation or that the program itself penalizes them for, you know, getting higher wages or working yep. more hours. And so they don't. And they just stay stuck, you know? And that that is part of what's leading to this, like, generational divide. Like, Gen Z is not doing well. And these laws are not helping us. Like, we are really We're not doing on the well, struggle guys. bus, you guys. Like, <laughs> we really are. It's going to be impossible to afford housing. We've talked about this a million times. Like, I've decided that I'm probably not going to buy a house for another five years. And that's actually like kind of ahead, you're still ahead of the curve because yeah. many will never buy a house. I mean, there's millennials who are almost never own a house. I mean, they'll be 60 before they can afford a house. Yeah. Um, and back to that study from the Public Policy Institute of California, to your point, they found, and mind you, this is two decades old, but updated versions have still stayed pretty consistent. But they found that three out of four low income families. Um, in California don't even have a minimum wage worker. So this isn't helping the poorest people living below the poverty line in California. Actually, it found that the people living below the poverty line in California, they're mostly poor because they work a regular part-time salary job where they just don't have enough hours or they're on welfare or they're wow. disabled and collecting unemployment. So the majority of these poor people that it's supposedly helping are literally just on unemployment yeah. or they just don't work enough hours. So we're actually attacking like the lower middle class with this mm -hmm. uh, artificial uh, wage increase. That is so interesting. Um, there's this great quote from Anthony Davies and James Har Harrigan. They co-wrote the article. I don't know who said it, but it's great. Um, the way to increase wages is to increase the value of workers' labor. And that happens through education, skills training, and work experience. Raising the minimum wage doesn't provide for either of the first two, and it makes the it makes it harder to obtain the third. What the minimum wage does do, however, is allow politicians to buy votes from more abled workers by disemploying the less abled. Mic drop. Yeah. I found it so interesting. It doesn't provide the education or skills training, and it makes it harder to obtain work experience. Yeah. That is so true. And, and that really <laughs> is the way to lift yourself up out of poverty and to you know, increase your wages beyond whatever the minimum wage is or whatever it is that you're making right now. It's just gaining more education, skills, and work experience, genuinely. This is going to, again, exponentially increase the archetype of, like, the barista at Starbucks who has a master's degree because these are the only people are gonna, who, who are going to be hired by a major employer for $20 an hour to make mm -hmm. food. It's going to be somebody who has, who is very much overqualified, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And the 16-year-old who needs a summer job, sorry, you're out of luck. The um, person who maybe is a felon, honestly, we're not giving these people bootstraps to help because, sorry, nobody's going to hire you for $20 an hour. You kind of need to start, start over, but there's nowhere to start over from. There is no bootstrap yeah. to pull yourself up from. And that's a huge criticism that progressives have over the right. Well, you guys just keep saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but you hand them no bootstraps. This yeah. is yanking away the bootstrap. Think about the ladder of like wages, you know, like you can climb up the ladder, but what if the first rung is something you can't even It's 10 reach? feet off the ground. Like, where do you start? You know? Nowhere. You go to Skid Row. <laughs>
went straight to Skid Row. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> straight to the streets. I mean, we're, it's funny, but this is the reality yeah. for a lot of people. This is going to be the reality for many people in our generation. Yeah. Um, and, and they say libertarians don't care about poor people. I care about poor people more than these Democrat socialists mm-hmm. do sitting up in their mansions with Gavin Newsom's multi-million yeah. dollar business, multi, multi, multi-million dollar net worth while he worries himself about running the state or running the country or whatever he wants to do, his giant j- fund for hair gel that he is always raking <laughs> through his cranium. I mean, it, 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 you, you got to give him to him, folks, because <laughs> these people just prey on the most easily manipulated voters, and yeah. it works every time, and I feel bad for the base Californians because as a former Los Angelino, I know a lot of base Californians who know mm-hmm. what's going on, who did not vote for Gavin Newsom, um, yeah. who did not vote for the leftists in charge of Los Angeles and San Francisco, and there's just there's just a huge gap in the education and honestly yeah. like IQ level in the voters because they're very easily tricked over there. They hear $20 minimum wage and think, I want $20 in my pocket right now, and then they go vote for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we both worked these jobs. Yeah. That is that is the attitude. Like, if if I went back to those jobs and this was a law being passed, everybody would be celebrating yeah. and not find the correlation once people's hours started getting cut and they started getting laid off. They would probably end up blaming the business owners and saying they're being greedy and just don't want to yep. pay us more. But it's like, they can't. They can't. It Businesses me, have to be profitable, you know? It reminds me of my old job, guys. I used to work at Friendly's in Pennsylvania. If you don't know what Friendly's is, it's kind of like Denny's. It has, like, a big reputation mm-hmm. for, like, good Sundays and, like, burgers and stuff. And I worked there for my freshman and sophomore year of college. The minimum wage for servers in Pennsylvania is $2.83. At least it was, like, mm-hmm. three years ago. Um, and, of course, that's, like, absurdly low when you hear $2.83. But, of course, you make tips um, on top of that. And I got... Pretty decent hours. I worked whenever I wanted to work. Then COVID happened. A lot of people couldn't come to work. The restaurant shut down for a while. And then when it came back, a lot of people were on unemployment. So they just didn't feel like coming back. Because why would you? Why would you come to yeah. work and just when you could just sit at home and make the same amount? Um, and when uh, people started to try to come back, people got crap hours. Um, and so I was actually the only server who was on like four or five days a week because wow. other servers were given like crap hours, literally crap hours, and then it just wasn't worth it to come and make $2.83. Plus with COVID, a lot of people ate out a lot less, so you're not making yeah. a lot of tips on top of that. So some of those Gosh. checks would be uh, like just obscenely small. That friendly is out of business now. I worked there for two years oh, no. and a lot of good people worked there. A lot of people were supporting families on that friendlies. It got replaced by a Mr. Beast Burger, guys. This is this is like this is what they call like late stage capitalism. This is actually <laughs> we do not is, endorse. This is late stage <laughs> no, socialism. This is late Go stage socialism. <laughs> and then Mr. Beast comes in and buys a building Bruh. from friendlies, and then all the people that work there got to find different jobs. Um, and Dude, that's I'm not, actually really funny. It's so ironic. <laughs> like, I'm not blaming Mr. Beast at all. Like, I hope that, I hope maybe they hired some more people from the community to work there. I, yeah, I, I'm yeah. sure almost. But <laughs> Mr. Beast, dog. when will you answer for your? Crimes? When will you? No, <laughs> shout out to Friendly Dog. I miss him. It was a fun place to work. Yeah, I ate a lot of free food there. Yeah, I I kind of do miss the the culture of those first jobs because yeah. you just got to like meet so many different yeah. types of people. I'm like, why am I beefing with an 83 year old and the who's a dishwasher right now <laughs> and best friends with like a 50 year old single mom who drives me to and from work every yeah. day? Yeah, it, it makes you have the life experience of like right. five lives. But guess what? 19-year-olds and 18-year-olds in college, because that's how old I was when I worked there, like 18 to 20 years old, they're not going to have that experience anymore if, if you work at a fast food restaurant in California yeah. because why would they hire you? Why would they hire me? Because mm-hmm. I had like I had schedule constraints because I was on the wrestling team, so I'm like, okay, I can only work these days from these hours. I can only do this, that, and that. And they worked around it because guess what? I was They were only paying me $2.83 an hour. The rest of the money I made was yes. from collecting tips, but at these fast yes, casual they didn't restaurants. Yes, take a huge cut hiring that, you. That, yeah. yeah, it was nothing to them. But at these uh, fast casual and fast food restaurants in California where they're not tipped workers, they're making exorbitant amounts now, $20 an hour. Sorry, you're going to get one hour a week. Your coworker is going to be a robot, and then you're going to get fired next month. Yeah, I wanted to, before we wrap up, I was preparing for this episode, went to take a Twitter break, and stumbled across this 
As one does. Juicy, juicy thread of terrible takes about this uh, minimum wage law. Um, this lady said, saw someone say, if you pay fast food workers a, liv- a livable wage, they'll stay in those jobs forever. Okay, so if someone loves working at Waffle House, why shouldn't they get paid enough to make that their career? 137,000 likes, guys. 137 likes, or 37,000 likes. If you want to make Waffle House your career, go ahead. The point is, is that we shouldn't have to supplement that. You're, ta- you're making an active sacrifice. Every, every economic decision you make involves some kind of sacrifice. You're sacrificing higher wages. And Waffle House actually pays well, and you can rise up through the ranks of Waffle House. Like, By the way, the person no who wrote this can't. tweet is a TV writer who is, like, on the strike. <laughs> so I just find that really of funny course. and ironic. Oh, my God. And BuzzFeed... Shout oh, no. out to oh, no. uh, okay. Ashley Ray, the genius who Sorry. made that tweet. I wasn't going to call you out, you know. We call out bad um, economy takes on here, so. Yeah. Um, and then I saved a few more replies that I found pretty egregious. Um, <laughs> why do we never say that about Wells Fargo or J.P. Morgan? If we pay these people a livable wage, they'll want to stay there forever. Maybe because working at a bank involves skill. That's Those... not unskilled labor. What are you guys talking about? And by the way, by the way, unskilled doesn't mean that it's easy. It just means that you haven't had to go through a lot of training to do it. Yeah. Anyone, almost anyone, almost anyone. I have interviewed people before for these jobs, and some people <laughs> are unemployable, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, but... Like, most people can work these unskilled labor jobs, right? So to make yourself a more valuable employee, you get skills. So you can get go, go and get hired at Wells Fargo or J.P. They Morgan, know that. and they'll pay you more. They know that. This is that. basic. This they is know basic. That. Because okay. if they wanted to live off of one job in their career for the rest of their life, then they'd obtain the skills to work at J.P. Morgan yes. or a bank or Wells Fargo or whatever. They know that. Just because you want to make waffles for the rest of your life, like you said, we don't have to supplement that. Why, go become a waffle chef. Open open up a nice gourmet waffle place. Yeah. I don't know. There's many options. But they want to benefit from the genius business model that is Waffle House and the clientele that Waffle House already brings. Yeah. Um, the food, the supplies, everything that is shipped to Waffle House by the owner who takes all the risk. So guess what? You don't deserve to get to live your fancy, cushy life because you have a low risk job and a low risk. Of, I mean, the most risk at Waffle House is some crackhead coming in. Honestly, that's actually a high risk. I'm sorry. Pay people at Waffle House more. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be fighting in there. They, 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 they Honestly, actually just need security. Actually, no. There is some kind of skill that goes into Waffle House. That, that one lady who fight the chair. Yes. I need that video again. <laughs> but yeah. Um, this. Other Twitter user said, or X user said, same crowd that hates self-service machines too. Like, do you want people to work these jobs? Do you or understand no? why we don't like self-service machines, buddy? It's not because you're a better worker than the self-service machine. If I go to McDonald's and type the little iPad, I know my order's gonna get right because it prints out the receipt and nobody's gonna mishear me. However, I hate when I walk into a McDonald's and see four self-service machines and one cashier because I know that could be four other cashiers having a job. I want that for you. I want better for y'all, but y'all don't see that. You don't see the vision. Y'all don't see the vision. <laughs> um, and then. Hopefully I can read this. I'll, I'll, I'll censor it. This one lady, we will not name names. Um, no free promo- promotion for this woman. If pizza delivery jobs paid more than uh, $7.49 an hour when I was in college, I might never have got into corn. LMFAO. I loved those jobs. I, wor- I worked at like five different ones. Okay. Now we're just blaming bad life choices. This is on yeah, a lot of pizza there, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of uh, you know those like red pill guys on Twitter who are like <laughs> women make bad choices. They just go into you know SW as a career. There is some truth to that. There's there's a certain level of truth to that. No judgment, but don't blame the the pizza wages for your decision. Like what? Everyone in college has a crappy job. 
that doesn't pay very much. You're like barely scraping by. You're eating PB and J sandwiches and ramen all Are the time. Are you saying we deserve that, Maggie? Yeah, it's part <laughs> kind of. of the grind. It's <laughs> part of. of like becoming a human being and having life experience, you know? Yeah. Learning how to like survive under those conditions is good, actually. Actually, I'm shocked at how little I made in college and yeah. how little I survived the, on. The way that my hourly wage wage used to be two dollars eighty three cents an hour, bruh. But it's character building. It I is. earn tips on top of that. Yes. I use that experience on my resume to get mm -hmm. my next job after that. Yeah. And it is what it is. Some people just don't have that. I guess go get a mentality or the work ethic or the you know IQ level to uh, go after that next job, and they're very content being a pizza driver. Okay, if you're content being a pizza delivery driver, you should be content with the money that that makes. Yeah, you have to be content with the lifestyle that, that offers you. Sorry. That's just how it is. Not sorry. It's, it's the agreement that you're making with an employer. Every yeah. contract, every wage that you accept, that's an agreement. You said yes. You can choose to forfeit that agreement, usually at any time you want, but you voluntarily shows that contractual agreement. Yeah, it's the same argument with student loans. You agreed to pay mm -hmm. that price. I did not, so don't come crying to me to forcefully take my money yeah. and redistribute it. I do feel a little bit bad about the student loans, but okay. it is I feel is bad consensual. because people were, I, I yeah. do feel bad because could an 18 year old take out a loan for a mortgage? Could they take out a loan for a business? No. no. But you, your choices include picking up a gun and going overseas to die for this country, or taking out six-figure loans to do some or uh, go to school. If you, even if you haven't taken out like a major yet, you don't even know what you're going to do with your life. But you've been tricked into thinking you need a four-year, six-figure college degree to do anything in life. So I do find it to be unfortunate. Mm -hmm. It is unfortunate. But the yeah. way we keep perpetuating this cycle is to make sure that people don't basically pay for their actions or they don't face their consequences. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? These people who grew up and went through all that and you know spent 20 years paying off their student loans, that really sucks. I hate that yeah. for you. But you're going to tell your kids, never make that mistake. Don't yes. make the same mistake I did. You're going to tell your friends, yes. don't take out those loans. Because that's why I didn't take any loans. I yeah. saw people. Dude, my mom talked about how much she... Um, and and her uh, her yeah. father, my grandfather, worked to pay off their student loans, and they were a lot less back then. Yeah, my mom uh, went to medical school, so was paying off loans for forever, and I saw that. Like I saw my parents paying off loans, and so um, when I went to college, I chose like a state school that was pretty low cost, applied for scholarships, all of that, because I was like, no, thank you, but. Everybody makes mistakes when you're a teenager. Everybody it's has okay. Those days. I'm not judging. Olivia, I did want to ask you, just in case anyone's watching that is working in the service industry or close to minimum wage, how did you pull yourself up by the bootstraps? <laughs> so I found a passion that was mm -hmm. outside of the industry. And if you want to stay in that industry, that's completely fine. If I had stayed there, I mean, they asked me to become like a part time manager while I was still there. Mm -hmm. And that was like my second year working there. And it just didn't end up working out because COVID happened, lockdown happened. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting a better job. But so first is find your passion, even if that's the same industry, and stick with it. I mean, I didn't give up uh, when it came to what I do now, which is like in political commentary and strategy and reporting. I used to do that for free. I used to go to school, go to work, and then do what I do now for free. So I'd write articles and pitch them to places. I'd record podcasts, go and do citizen journalist stuff mm -hmm. at different events, record myself, um, give basically free advice on social media strategy. Because even at the time, I still was growing my page to, I probably had like 20 or 30K followers on Twitter at the time. So I still was pretty knowledgeable on that. Um, I know it sounds cliche, but kind of find your hobby, find something that you would do for free and find how to monetize it or capitalize off of it. And that's my best advice to people. That's exactly what I've done. I have a lot of fun. I love what I do. Mm -hmm. um, I love getting paid for it even more. Um, that's a really <laughs> added convenient bonus. But yeah, that I mean, maybe this sounds like super privileged, like, oh, it must be super easy to just yeah. be good at something. But I wasn't always good at something. Nobody no, is. I no. wasn't born with a Twitter following. I wasn't born talking about politics. I wasn't born with the knowledge to do any of that. Yeah. Um, 
And my uh, kind of one of my other passions actually is cooking. So I actually wouldn't mind going back into the restaurant industry one day. So if the time allows or if I kind of find myself in the position to open like a food truck or become like a chef, I would actually really, really love that. So Olivia, we should open a business we together. Should. That's one of my dreams is to open like a like a like European style cafe, Ooh. restaurant, bar type Ooh. situation. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, guys. So come over to the restaurant. Um, <laughs> the Undoctrination Restaurant. Oh, my God. We need a better <laughs> that name. That would be a horrible name for a We restaurant. had to make it like European. <laughs> Undoctrination. <laughs> Gotta make it sound Undoctrination. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, for me, like, I... I have a very similar story to Olivia, but one piece of advice that I could really give um, for any situation, if you feel like you're stuck at a certain career level, is to take risks on yourself. I think a lot of us are really um, averse to rejection, and that's why we don't push ourselves um, try to go back to school or try to gain new skills or apply for that job that we really want, but we're unsure if they're going to mm-hmm. like us. Um, like any, like those things that scare you because you're scared of the rejection and not necessarily scared of the work you would be doing, go apply for those. See what kind of relevant skills you need and then work on building those. There, there are so many ways to get many degrees or like, Take courses online that get you certified in certain things and just start from there. Like, start from, you know, I'm going to do this even if it scares me. Like, I think confidence is one of the biggest things that keeps people from moving out of a certain income bracket because you feel like you're stuck there. Like, you can't make it out of that income bracket. I don't know. That's just my perspective as someone who is like, you know, filtered in and out of different income brackets. Um, Because I lived, I lived in a very poor area in college, and I remember being around people that were unemployed, like not not minimum wage, but like unemployed. It was really bad. But also, I remember being around, um, like, in the income bracket of people, just like working, but around people that were older in those situations too. And I think a lot of it comes down to having the confidence to just apply. Mm -hmm. You guys know how many times I failed? You guys know how many websites and publications I sent my god-awful articles to when I was like 17, 18 years old? And the one that accepted me didn't even pay me, and it wasn't a big website at all, but they kept publishing me. And the next one also didn't pay me, and it was a slightly bigger website, and they kept publishing me. And then I would make like $15 $15 per article, and boy, did I think I was rolling in cash when I started to get paid <laughs> $15 an article. Shout out to the Daily Caller. Um, that was, I want to say that was like my first time getting paid for writing, and that was after I did a full unpaid internship there, wow. and I'm not mad about it because it gave me the skills to yeah. get that paying job there later and also to get pay, much higher paying jobs mm-hmm. in journalism way later than that. And I mean, this is even way later. So this was in 2020 when I was getting paid $15 per article. I'm not going to disclose how much it is now, but it's several times more than that now. And I don't have a degree. When I did go to school, it was not for communications. It was not for journalism. It was not for writing. It was for political science, which is, guys, never go to school for political science. Unless you're going to go to law school after or something, stop. Please, God, stop. I was also in school for political stop. science. Stop. See, this is what happens to you. This is what happens yes. to you. <laughs> Don't be like me. I might act, I'm actually considering going back to college, so I'm not, I don't think we're advocating that you just don't go to college. Like, Education do what is works for really you. valuable, but do what works for you. And don't get into six figures in debt because, I mean, unless you're going yeah. to law school or medical school and some, something that's like, almost like a pretty much guaranteed high-paying job, you don't need it for underwater basket weaving. I promise you, you can learn that on your own. So true. So true. I learned how to write on my own. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. I think this is a great place to wrap up. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Liberty Anders. And Olivia, where can we follow you? I'm also on Twitter at Rondo Olivia and Instagram at Rondo.Olivia. And I'm in the studio all week, so I'm excited. Woo! You guys are going to see more videos and content of me and Maggie sitting here next to each other. Yeah. And it'll be good. Yeah. It'll be Don't really forget good. to like, comment, Hit that subscribe button and share this on social media. Thank you so much.